The Lord be with you. As you're turning to the first chapter of Luke's Gospel, I'm reminded of an old hymn. Sing ye islands of the sea, echo back ye ocean caves. The earth will keep her jubilee, Jesus saves. Thank you, choir. Now, Pat. First chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Perhaps reading this story might make you feel at least a little chilly, like it's Christmas again. Luke chapter 1, beginning with verse 26, we'll read through verse 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, God, we pray for ears here. Ears to hear your words and not whatever words I put in the way. Ears to hear words that call to us to do what you call us to do so that we may be the people you call us to be. Speak now, Holy Spirit, we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. I remember... Way back when, now 20 years ago, it sounds weird to say, back in 1999, while most folks were talking about the new millennium and my dad was worrying about whatever the Y2K was, I only had one thing on my mind. I was turning 16 in February of 2000. And so I had all these dreams about what it was going to mean to turn 16 and get my driver's license. You see, for most of 1999, I had a permit, and so I was driving either my mom's blistered Burgundy Ford Taurus that smoked a little bit when you cranked it up in the morning, always with her sitting in the passenger seat, or any one of the number of jalopies that passed over Dad's driveway. He had a white celebrity station wagon with, with this red velveteen interior. He had a blue Dodge Dynasty that the trunk we had to sort of uh, rig up because it was one of those you shut and it's supposed to catch and pull down, but it didn't always catch and pull down. And, of course, his old 75 Custom Deluxe. I couldn't wait, though. I couldn't wait to be free from the requirements of having this licensed adult in the passenger seat of one of their cars. I couldn't wait to be free to drive on my own and to drive what was obviously going to be my much cooler hot-rodded Chevy Chevelle or some lifted four-wheel drive truck so I could go and do secret burnouts on some stretch of state highway to take off in some old dirt pit getting mud up past the roof of the truck. I had all these daydreams about what it was going to be like, expectations taken from car magazines, the automotive shows I watched on Sunday mornings, and those few Saturday nights in the parking lot beside the Dairy Queen with my older half-brother and his Mercury Capri with all of his friends and their lifted pickup trucks. 
Like so many soon-to-be 16-year-olds, I had all sorts of grand expectations of what it was going to be like to drive. And then I turned 16. I remember the night I turned 16, my dad said, boy, put your britches on, we're going to town. My mom was in the hospital at the time, and I thought we were going to go see my mom, but instead, dad had borrowed $300 from grandma, and we went to the Ray Dean Auto Auction just outside of Dothan, Alabama, where we wound up buying a ragged-out 1988 Plymouth Sundance, and it is just as uncool as it sounds. <laughs> it did have four wheels and tires, but only two of them matched. And there was more than one and a half rotations of play in the steering wheel. It was a death trap. Didn't even have a battery. I remember jumping it off in the dirt lot outside of the auction barn. Dad getting in the driver's seat, driving down the road, putting about $3 worth of gas in it. Made it all the way home without a battery. When I got my license just a few months later, I went from volunteering to drive to, does somebody want to drive? Oh, I'll drive. I'll drive us to Mall's house. I'll drive. I'll drive to being volunteered to drive. Oh, Chris will take you. He's got a car. Chris will, do, Chris will take you to school. Chris will take you all to Walmart. Chris will do it. Chris will do it. Started acting as a free taxi service to my sister and step-siblings. Of course, I had to buy my own gas, my own insurance, on top of paying Grandma back for the $300 that Dad borrowed for me. So I got a job at the Chevy dealership, mostly sweeping cigarette butts out of the parking lot get me gas to get back and forth to that job, to buy groceries around the house, and depending on the month, to pay one bill or another. And then, of course, the liability insurance required to drive my faded white jalopy. It wasn't a souped-up Chevelle. It wasn't a lifted pickup. It was a Sundance. So much for expectations. Reality has a way, I think, of correcting our expectations. I suppose, but then again, we don't really just pull our expectations out of thin air, right? They're not just things that we conjure up on our own. A young person graduates from college, expects to find a job. Why? Because she thinks she deserves it? No, because her parents did it that way. Because her high school counselor told her she would. Because the brochure from the university printed right there, 98% placement of graduates. A couple gets married. Spends a couple of years building a life together, buying a home, painting the nursery, expects to have a baby. Why? Because they think they should? Because they think they, they owe it to the world? No. Well, because their friends are. Because they want a child. Because their social media feeds are filled with pregnancy photo shoots out in some pasture next to some rustic fence. Because there are pictures of babies and cute little outfits. A man... Worked hard for nearly a decade at the same job. Expects a promotion and a raise. Why? Because he thinks he deserves it because of who he is? No, because he's worked hard at the same company, at the same job. Rarely missing a day. Always putting in his time, doing his job well. But sometimes no one's hiring a college graduate. Sometimes a couple can try and pray and undergo private and invasive procedures, but still the pregnancy test is negative. Sometimes a man can work hard for years and years and still get overlooked by someone younger, more willing to sacrifice their integrity for a promotion. Sometimes, I don't know, maybe most times, our expectations go unfulfilled. And maybe, maybe sometimes, that's God. The call against our expectations. That seems to be how God shows up for Mary. Now I know, as we said, this story is usually reserved for a much cooler climate, but maybe our hearing it a bit outside of its usual context will help us to notice something from a different perspective. Something outside of our expectations about the story of Gabriel and Mary. In the sixth month, that's of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph. The virgin's name was Mary. Now first, I have to tell you, as much as I like the NRSV, I don't like this translation. Mary isn't just simply engaged to Joseph. 
They didn't go out to eat a few times. They didn't go see a few movies. And then one day on the way home, Joseph opened the door and dropped to one knee and said, Mary, will you marry me? That's not how it works. Mary is betrothed to Joseph. And that isn't nearly as romantic as it sounds. Mary's father would have arranged the wedding, the marriage, for Mary to Joseph. She's likely a teenager, maybe 15 or 16, maybe a year or two younger, maybe a year or two older. Joseph was likely much older, possibly a widower with his own children from his first marriage, a notion born out of the Catholic tradition protecting Mary's perpetual virginity and Jesus' siblings. So after their official betrothal, Mary would live with her parents for a year, with the wedding eventually coming and lasting a whole week. And for all intents and purposes, though, Mary and Joseph are married from the moment of betrothal. So if Joseph had died in that whole year, Mary would be a widow. And life's hard for a widow, especially a teenage widow. She would have been thought at best to just have bad luck, at worst to be cursed by God. And no man wants to marry a woman whose husband died in betrothal. So Mary's expectations would involve just simply continuing on in her betrothal to Joseph, being properly wed to him, bearing him children, preferably sons, and living her life out quietly as a woman in a culture where the most she could hope to be is a subservient wife and mother. Mary, as far as we know, was a devout Jewish woman, so her expectations of God would have been rather ordinary. A divine being who resides up there somewhere, maybe out there or behind the curtain in the most holy place of the temple. A God who mostly lets the world play out as it is, judging our sins, requiring atonement through sacrifices and the devout adherence of the law. The thought that God, that God would intervene in history in such a personal way to a woman, To a young woman, to a poor young woman in a backwater like Nazareth, that goes against everyone's expectations. So when Gabriel, an angel, uh, literally the Greek word is angelos, it just means messenger. A messenger sent by God shows up at Mary's place. The effect of his presence is perhaps more than we may realize You see, in Mary's day, there was a popular story that went around. If you have a a Bible with the Apocrypha in it, you have this story. Christians read this story for at least 1,500 years of their existence. A story called Tobit. And in this story, an angel appears to a bride on her wedding night and kills her bridegroom over and over. Now you think about that. That's a popular story going around in Mary's day. She is betrothed to Joseph. And who shows up? An angel? What do you think she's thinking? This man, this angel, is about to dust old Joseph off. Mary may have likely thought of that story. And perhaps the appearance of an angel would have caused her to think that, yeah, he showed up to kill Joseph and make me a widow, making my future harder, shattering my expectations. Or perhaps maybe, maybe something even darker had crossed Mary's mind. Something that, I'll be honest with you, had never crossed my male mind in all the years that I've read this story. Gabriel, for all we know, in the appearance of a man, no great wings, no halo, no oh, or around him. A man, a stranger, shows up in Mary's house, knows her name, and tells her she's about to conceive a child. I can imagine for any number of women, that might be terrifying. Terrifying in ways most men will never understand. So whatever her initial feelings may have been, Mary's expectations of life are soon to be shattered by Gabriel's annunciation. Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. You will name him Jesus. He will be great 
called the Son of the Most High, the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will rule over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Greetings, favored one. You found favor with God. You will conceive in your womb and bear a son. Perhaps the sound of those words, when they are, are accompanied with a composition from Handel, or read in the soft glow of the lights of a Christmas tree, maybe they sound nice. But think with me for a moment of just how disruptive those words must have been for Mary. How can a woman be favored or blessed if she's about to become inexplicably pregnant? I don't care what culture or what time in history it is, and it seems that most folks don't care about the facts in most situations, but it always seems that when a young girl turns up pregnant, she is immediately labeled, shamed, and ostracized. While I remember when I was in high school, even junior high, when a girl would wear a baggy sweater when it was clearly too hot outside for one. How kids would whisper around their lockers. You know what happened to her, don't you? She got pregnant. You knew it was going to happen. How some girls would disappear over a long break, maybe Christmas, maybe spring break, only to come back in the next fall, back a grade, telling everyone, yeah, I was sick, mom and dad kept me out of school. Or uh, growing up in a military town, it was easy to say, well, we traveled and we had to come back. Whenever a young girl out of wedlock begins to show, the boy involved is often forgotten. The finger pointing, the criticisms and the judgments start. And I don't doubt for one second it wasn't the same for Mary. In fact, it would have been worse. Because Mary wasn't a student in junior high or high school. She was betrothed, as good as married. And now she'd start to show signs of that pregnancy. Who in the world is going to believe a teenage girl that God got her pregnant? Would you believe it? How is this proof that she's favored by God? What's more, having a baby, it's not wrapped up with all the joy and candy-coated almonds that it is today. In Mary's day, there are no maternity wards, no OBGYNs, no epidurals, no neonatal units, no nice soft blankets and pictures to be taken. There's none of that. The chance of a baby surviving childbirth wasn't near the guarantee it is now, and it's not even much of one these days. So if the baby did survive, there was no wick. There was no social safety net. You'd have to feed that baby. You'd have to raise that baby. And in Mary's case, you'd have to shield that baby from all of those who would likely bully in him for being that bastard child of that loose girl from Nazareth. And on top of it all, Mary would have to come to learn that her oldest son, the one she had been told was God's son, whose kingdom would be forever and ever and ever, won't get to wear a crown of gold, but a crown of thorns that he would be belittled, mocked, betrayed, nailed to a cross, executed as a criminal and abandoned. What mother would count herself blessed to know her child would have that kind of life? How is this being favored by God? If you want to be favored by God, well, that, that comes with a, a different set of expectations, doesn't it? If you're favored by God, you tend to stand up a little bit straighter than everyone else. You might wake up in a slightly better mood than the rest of us unfavored folks. Things tend to go your way more often when you're favored by God. You always get the closer spot at Walmart, an extra wing in your basket at Struts. You get no rain on your beach vacation, the winning raffle ticket. Why, to be favored by God is to be, to be envied by others, isn't it? It means life is just a little bit easier. You're a little bit happier. Things go a little bit smoother. And when somebody asks you why you're in such a good mood, why things seem so great, you just tell them, like my friend Jay over in Atlanta says, I'm blessed and highly favored. That's the expectation, right? And, and, and hear me say this, because I don't want you walking out of here saying, oh, Chris says we all got to be down in the dumps and doldrums all the time. Hear me when I say this. There's nothing wrong with that. To give God the credit for those things in your life that always seem to break your way. But what? What if being favored by God sometimes 
means answering the call against those expectations. What if God is found in the disruptive call against those expectations? Mary can't help but ask Gabriel after hearing his enunciation, how, how, how can this be since I'm a virgin? It's an appropriate question. But Gabriel's answer isn't exactly comforting. It's not exactly one Mary can offer as proof to her betrothed, to Joseph, to her family, to her in-laws. Mary, Mary, how did you come up pregnant? Can you hear her saying, well, the Holy Spirit came upon me. The power of the Most High overshadowed me. And the child that I'm carrying will be holy, the Son of God. And by the way, Elizabeth, you know, she conceived in her old age. She's six months pregnant now. Nothing will be impossible. With God. When Gabriel says it, we set it to music. But if Mary says it, what do we do? Oh, Mary. Mary. Maybe Elizabeth's own miraculous pregnancy would bring some sort of relief to Mary. Elizabeth in her old age conceiving a son. But I've stood in the line at Johnson's. I've stood in line at the grocery store. I see the weekly world news. I see those grocery store tabloids just like you do. Woman 96 bears 14. You've seen them. Maybe they're a lie. Maybe there's some truth to them. You've seen the stories on the news. Woman, way, way on up past child-rearing years, has a child. Maybe Elizabeth's miraculous conception brings some sort of comfort to Mary, some bit of evidence to use in her own defense, but Mary is facing a future that is less than exciting. The next months will be filled not only with the pains and discomforts of pregnancy, but the rumors. You know, she said it's God's baby. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? The accusations. You know what I heard happen? I I think Joseph and Mary, I think they went ahead and sped up the betrothal. That's what I heard happen. Explanations. No, no, it doesn't happen that way. You know how she got pregnant. Then all those confrontations she'll no doubt have to have with Joseph. Joseph, I need to tell you something. Uh, Gabriel, you don't know him, but you will. Gabriel, come by the house. This is what happened. Mama, Daddy, I need to tell you something. Ma-in-law, Pa-in-law, I need to tell you something. Folks in the community, you need to know. But as potentially scandalous as Mary's pregnancy could have been, such a scandal could not come close to the disruption it promised. You think it's scandalous for a teenage girl to suddenly have a baby and say it's God's? No. It's scandalous to know that God's no longer up there. That God's no longer out there. That God's no longer hidden behind a curtain. Some distant deity waiting for the sin of our burnt offerings to slake His wrath for our sins. No As it turns out, God was never that way. God so longed for us. God, as the fourth gospel said, so loved us that God entered into the very matter of this world to prove it. You think a teenage girl who's pregnant is scandalous. It's not nearly as scandalous as God becoming us. You see, it's not just Mary's unexpected pregnancy that ruins our expectations, that runs against our expectations. It's not just the miraculous conception of her son that calls her to something else altogether different from that which she expected. No, the call comes in the very reality that God is entering into human life. Into this dirty, destructive, depraved, corrupt, and still somehow weirdly wonderful world. For our expectations of God are that God remains God somewhere else. In some time else, on a throne in heaven, not in the womb of a teenager. Our expectations of God are bound up in God's location above and beyond us. On some plane where God is able to omnisciently record our every infraction. Not born into this world in the painful, sticky mess of birth, wrapped in rags and placed in a feed box. Our expectations of God are so often bound up in images of power and might, victory and triumph, glory and strength, not in a girl with a scared and shaky voice saying, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with you. Let it be with me according to your word. 
Our expectations of God are too often caught up in the grand images of the Renaissance masters. These muscular men with piercing eyes and forceful gestures commanding our attention by their very physicality. Not the stumbling attempts of a toddler to walk holding the hand of his mother Mary toward the outstretched arms of his adopted father Joseph. Our expectations of God seem too often to be expectation forged from our own desires for a God who judges sin with an immovable will and an iron resolve, not a God who hangs bloody and beaten on a cross asking forgiveness for those who put Him there. Perhaps the call of God comes to us against our expectations. Comes to us in ways we expect, sure, through blessings and feelings of favor that lift our spirits and cause us to give thanks. And thanks be to God when it does come that way. But maybe the call of God is a bit more disruptive. Calling against our expectations. Forcing us to accept what we may not want to accept otherwise. If that's so, and I believe it is, at least sometimes. If that's so, I pray we all have the faith of Mary that we may answer against our expectations of God and ourselves. Not to run towards comfort. Not to run towards that which we expect and know. But to run toward God. To be able, like Mary, to say, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. According to God's disruptive call. And we have the faith of Mary who carried the one who carries our sins even against our expectations. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray for the faith of Mary to be our faith. That Lord, even when you enter into our lives and call us against what we may expect, Lord, give us the courage and strength to answer that call in the affirmative, to say, here am I. And it be with me according to your word, according to your call. Lord, maybe even now you're calling some of us against our expectations. Lord, help us not to resist, but to see that it is you in the midst of that call. And once again, Lord, help us. Help us, God, by your Holy Spirit to respond you in your presence among us. We ask these things now in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.